This is Times Radio. There are two stories really that are dominating the papers today. The first is all about a Zempic weight loss jab. So says the Times reduces heart deaths by a fifth. The Daily Mail put it as a Zempic slashes heart attack and stroke risk. A top cardiologist says we should prescribe the fat loss jab to millions. The other story um, is this arrest. Police officer charged with spying for the Chinese. The Telegraph says... China's fury at the arrest of these, uh, in inverted commas, UK spies, saying a border force officer, a home office immigration official, they were among three people charged yesterday with spying for Hong Kong. There's a photograph of uh, one of the special constables uh, on the front page of the paper as well. Let's go through these stories in a bit more detail. Joining me to do that is the barrister and broadcaster, Andrew Eborn. Andrew, good morning. Good morning, Rosie. Always a joy to join you. I mean, a Zempic seems to be this kind of miracle cure to, to, to weight loss. I mean, we don't have these sort of very lengthy long-term trials about uh, the impacts of what it is to take them. And we know some people who've taken them have said it sort of dampened their mood a little bit. But the results from this cardiologist suggest, you know, millions of us should be taking it. It sounds fantastic. It sounds like an entry to uh, the Eurovision Song Contest, uh, Ozempic, doesn't it, from Lithuania or something. Maybe. But, but looking, there was a report out this week talking about uh, uh, Sweden from Sweden's Lund University. That basically, half of all cancer cases are associated with obesity. So this is great news that there may be this wonderful cure that Ozempic, they're saying, is not just about losing weight, but it can also help uh, basically stop heart disease. And they've got this uh, European c- c- Congress on obesity uh, in Venice at the moment, it's very helpful because it's flat. And they're saying this is possibly the, uh, the biggest medical breakthrough since the introduction of statins in the 1990s. Um, the real question, however, is that, okay, you take this injection, it, it's dip, as I understand it, it suppresses your appetite. Uh, mm. The trouble is you then have to stay on it because otherwise as soon as you, uh, you stop it, your appetite comes back, doesn't it? Yeah, so what we've learned then in this trial, it was sort of three years and four months, the group who took semaglutide to what was a Zempic um, had a 20% lower risk of heart attack, stroke or death from heart disease. I mean, that's brilliant. They also lost 9% of their body weight. But, however, you raise the important question, Andrew, because, you know, yes, this suppresses appetite, uh, this drug, but it effectively means you can still eat a really poor diet. You're just eating much less of it. Is that an appropriate way to encourage, really, society, a societal shift, rather than to say, right, you can take this into your own hands, but we'll give you an injection that kind of alters your alters your your motivations is that the appropriate way to tackle the obesity crisis uh, you're absolutely right as always rosie what you need to look at it's it's very simple about weight loss i, I know it's difficult and it's trying to get the mind in the right sort of place but but it's really what whatever you put in and whatever you put out so uh, the less you consume and the more exercise you do uh, the better that's a much healthier way of doing it but what they are saying here is they say it does help with heart disease in the same way as statins and so on and so forth. Mm. The trial involved about 17,604 adults over the age of 65 who had heart disease. Uh, and basically that's a condition that affects 7.6 million people in the UK. Um, and therefore it's, it sounds really positive. But the point is you're going to have to be on it all the time, I would have thought. I'm, I'm not a doctor, but I would always encourage a healthy lifestyle. Do a bit of jogging, get into marathons. I know, but we've been do. encouraged that for years, and the obesity <laughs> crisis is, is worse. And I mean, William Hague's writing in the Times this morning, and he's talking about, you know, in terms of the health of our economy, a Zempic could absolutely accelerate it. I mean, in Denmark, and the Prime Minister mentioned this yesterday, a Zempic sort of really boosted economic growth there because, of course, it's, you know, reducing significantly health bills. So, you know, maybe from a political perspective, we should accelerate the, um, you know, the expansion of people taking a Zempic. Well, and it's a great piece, and I would recommend people read it in the Times. He was saying, look, basically the increase in GDP in Denmark was down to one company, Novo Nordisk who are the people who invented this weight loss drugs for Govia and Ozempic, uh, and they based in Denmark. And, and Rishi, in his brilliant speech yesterday, he says, we have to embrace technology. We punch way above our weight on things like AI, as you know, my, my pet subject all the mm. time, artificial intelligence, and other things. And it's look, his piece is really focusing on the economic benefits of it. Obviously, it, prevention is much better than cure in health. Uh, but I, I, as we said earlier, you need to look at the wider picture about how you get people healthy. There is no quick fix, I would say, as the short answer. Yeah, yeah. And let's look at the front page of The Guardian. Um, rent rises should be capped for millions of people who can't afford 
struggling rates. This is according to a report commissioned by the Labour Party. Do you think rent caps, Andrew, are an appropriate way to manage what is, you know, soaring rents? Well, it's a balance, isn't it? Because you want to encourage people to to build, you want to encourage landlords to make things available, whilst recognising that people are under a a lot of strain financially. Um, And it's interesting, because the the, the headline suggests Labour report. Well, it was basically Lisa Nandy uh, who commissioned the report when she was shadow housing secretary. But Labour themselves have cautiously welcomed the report because they recognise this difficulty. They they, they always say they're leaked proposals. You always wonder who leaks these things. Mm. But they've recognised recommended a range of measures uh, basically to give breathing room to renters uh, who are bu- uh, buckling under the cost of living. And, and so Keir Starmer's got to respond to this. Uh, they're talking about sort of tackling the housing crisis, which obviously is essential. We need to build more homes and make sure they are affordable. But at the same time, to recognise we're in commercial markets. So you want to make sure there are people willing to, to do these things. Well, because you don't uh, want to uh, discourage developers from building new homes. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. And, and that's the point. And I yeah, think... It, it's, Do you think there's nervousness from the Labour Party to do anything that would be deemed too overtly left-wing? Well, absolutely. I I think nowadays the parties, (laughs) I think left and right is is, is long gone. I think people, we should look at policies and uh, there are some common policies which make a lot of sense. But you do need that fine balance. Uh, I I say the devil is always in the details. Um, And it's talking about when rents can be uh, basically raised and putting those sort of restrictions in. uh, And rather than being going as far as some people wanted, uh, they're sort of turning around and saying, look, we recognise rents do need to be uh, increased occasionally. We also recognise you want to make sure that market forces uh, and people are encouraged to build ho- homes and and to do that as a business. Mm. Um, so I think that there is that caution. It'd be interesting to see how uh, Keir Starmer responds to that uh, and what Labour actually do as a policy. But as I say, the, the Labour report headline uh, is, is slightly misleading because they, they've sort of cautiously welcomed it rather than necessarily endorsing the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, we'll see what they decide to do in terms of uh, policy when the manifestos are released ahead of whenever the general election will be. Uh, the Telegraph yes. and the Times are talking about this the, the arrest really three people who were charged with spying for Hong Kong and China are pretty furious they say we strongly condemn the UK's unwarranted accusation against the Hong Kong special administrative region in the government it, it suggests you know we've got a, a border force officer home office immigration official a police officer um, all in this group of people who were charged that actually we are well I wonder what you think we are either successfully identifying where China are trying to infiltrate our, you know, our public services and our institutions, or uh, we're just getting a, a glimpse of how sophisticated a machine this actually is. Well, I think firstly, the absolute point that I always make is they've only been charged and and and, and taken. Uh, the, the trials are just starting, so uh, we haven't even heard their plea so mm. far. Um, so we have to be obviously put that air of caution on. Uh, but absolutely, we need to question things all of the time. Um, I, I always say that data is the new currency. The more information that is given to uh, foreign forces, um, uh, the, the more dangerous we are on that sort of basis. But it does highlight those those concerns. We have to be. Incredibly careful what's happening. There are spies amongst us, uh, and, and those will get revealed as it goes along. Uh, two of them have Chinese names. There's a third person uh, who's basically uh, sounding uh, with with a, a typical British name. Um, so it'd be interesting to see their, their sort of connection and, and and what's happened there. Yeah, they've uh, been but charged. As I said, it's the National Security Act. Well, Tom Tugendhat, the security minister, said this is a game changer for our ability to crack down on foreign intelligence services and hostile actors. So, uh, well, as you said, uh, very uh, helpful. And you know, the trial hasn't started, so when it does, we'll follow exactly um, what's happened there. There's a Minister for Common Sense, Andrew, in the Times, I'm looking this morning. Um, civil servants are going to be banned from wearing rainbow lanyards and universities must prioritise domestic students. This is uh, Esther McVeigh's sort of common sense fight back. Do you think it does make sense? Well, the wonderful Esther McVeigh, I, every week I used to share a studio with, with Esther doing the Andrew Eborn's Greatest Writs, uh, looking at legal cases. So I know Esther very well. Uh, this was the a position she was given uh, at the end of last year, you might remember. It's, and it's the first sort of major speech she's made with that. And what she's saying is, look, we don't want um, you know, basically progressive ideologies which have infiltrated our university schools and our public services. She's saying on. that we need what to- about a, a lanyard? 
Well, she's saying that the, the focus should be on doing the service. It, they don't want any political views, whatever they may be, on, on that sort of basis. This is her, her speech. So this is what she's saying is, at the moment, detracting uh, from what they're being able to do their jobs properly, uh, as opposed to the other stuff. Now, I'm fully supportive, as you know, of all sort of people and, and being able to express their opinions and so on and so forth. Uh, Esther's point is that it's not appropriate in the workforce and, and it's causing issues. And therefore, if we ban all of it across the board, doesn't matter whatever your opinions are and whatever rights you have to hold those opinions, let's not have it in the workforce, is what she's saying. I just, how important is it? I mean, this is the, what's going to change. Lanyards to hold security passes. And you can imagine in offices, people kind of want to have their own one or personalise them. Those worn yeah. by civil servants will now have to carry a standard departmental design rather than a random pick-a-mix of political statements, she said. And we've got a minister worried about this. I mean, clearly you think it's appropriate. Well, I think the thing is, it's about political activism. And so what she, what Tessa is saying is you don't want it in a visible way. Uh, you, you leave your political beliefs at the front door when you come in. Uh, and you're part of a happy team, is what she says. And if you apply it to everybody, so whatever your beliefs, whatever uh, your, your sexual persuasion and so on and so forth, all of that is just left at the door. You don't need to force it down everybody's throat in the workplace. Uh, that's her point. Uh, but it doesn't mean that people can't obviously celebrate uh, diversity and and so on and so forth. It's just not bringing it to the mm. workplace. Now, one thing that maybe falls under the category, I don't know, I'm not saying this, uh, it's trigger <laughs> warnings. Um, lots of people have said, oh, oh, that's so woke. Well, Judy Dench has said, here is a trigger warning, talking about the kind of, you know, what you often get before you go to the theatre or the film or even in a book about kind of managing your expectations about what's to come. She says, here's a trigger warning, just don't come. She's clearly oh. fed up. Oh, she's she's absolutely wonderful. The, she's going to be the first female member of the Garrett Club now that they've let her in 193 years later. Uh, no, she's absolutely right. The whole idea of going to the theatre, you're taken on a journey. There are going to be all sorts of surprises and terrible things. She talks about Lady Macbeth uh, and, and various warnings, King Lear uh, and so on and so forth. The whole idea is there are some horrendous scenes there. The, the audience is supposed to be taken on that journey. Giving trigger warnings uh, just, just sort of uh, spoils that in a way. And I I think it is completely wrong. Mm. It is just managing expectations, though, isn't it? Well, <laughs> yes, you can do that. You can say, oh, by the way, here's a spoiler in, in Act 3. This is what's going to happen. Oh, has, uh, I don't think that's <laughs> the same. It's not ruining <laughs> well, the plot could... to say, oh, there might be scenes of violence or, I don't know, intimacy that maybe wouldn't be appropriate. Well, no, but I'll tell you what, it's, it's Sir Ian McKellen, the glorious Sir Ian McKellen, he also made that point, you know, that he, he wanted the people to be surprised by what goes on in Act 3. Uh, and, and he was saying, he was warning about people entering the show, there's a loud noise at one point and there's flashing lights and a reference to bereavement and smoking and so on and so forth. And he said it was all completely wrong. You have to go on this element of surprise uh, and that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Final story, this was in the news uh, earlier with Tom, but this, this medal for fighting off a crocodile, remember the story in Mexico? of the twins. Absolutely. It was quite incredible. There's a fantastic quote, actually, that Tom uh, read out to me this morning. I'd like to read it to you, Andrew. Um, yeah. When they were swimming in Mexico, Georgia said her sister first raised the alarm, saying, I would have swum straight into it as I'm quite short-sighted. But Melissa said, mm, bleep, there's an expletive there. That's a crocodile. <laughs> when Georgia made it back to the relative safety on the riverbank, she heard her sister scream. I mean, it was a, a crazy story. And her sister just decided, you know, come what may, she was going to save her. Oh, and it's a glorious story. I mean, horrendous. When you, when you look at it, now, we all sort of joke about crocodiles and what you should sing and what not, not to sing. But, but Melissa, who, who lives with her sister in Sandhurst in Berkshire, uh, she talks about the 20-minute boat ride uh, after she managed to rescue her sister. And she said that Georgia was singing to her, stand by me and don't worry about a thing, a Bob Marley and so mm. on and so forth, uh, just to, to resurrect her. But it is horrendous. I mean, they, they were basically on holiday. They were, they were thinking it was safe to go out swimming. Uh, and, and all of a sudden there was this crocodile who attacked them in, in, in Puerto mm. Escondido in Mexico on June the 6th, 2021. Um, and, and they were there with two other holidaymakers. And all of a sudden, this crocodile came and came and got one of them. Um, it's an appalling story. Uh, but congratulations on, uh, I presume they both get the medal, which is fantastic. Um, uh, and, and the for recognition bravery. accordingly. Yeah, for I mean, bravery. Well, for, just, uh, I mean, uh, incredible. Georgia basically kept on punching the crocodile on the nose, which dazed it enough mm. for her to then be able to pull her sister out by her hair. It is an extraordinary story and uh, they've been, uh, well, honoured for bravery. Andrew, thank you so much for going through the stories with me this morning. Andrew Eborn, the barrister and the broadcaster. 
Across the UK, on DAB, online and on your smart speaker. This is Times Radio.